As I, uh, my name is Dr. Igina Francis Makwabe. I'm the consultant physician and nephrologist from Tanzania, working with Africa Healthcare Network. And I'm also the uh, chief medical director of AHN Tanzania. So today I'll be moderating this session together with uh, Dr. Jonathan Wara, who is a consultant physician and nephrologist. The Agakan Teaching Hospital for the first hour will be moderating this session with Dr. Slivian Pierre Nzeimana uh, from Burundi. Uh, he's the chairman of Burundi Medical Council, Burundi, a full member of uh, uh, and fellow of AISN. Uh, American Society of Nephrology and Canadian Society of Nephrology. Good evening. So uh, we'll be moderating together and we'll be asking questions. I mean, asking yes. questions and listening to texts and yes. to the presenters. Yeah. So today's topic is yes. uh, inter introduction to interventional nephrology. This is a new topic, and I was so excited when Dr. Gurav, uh, uh, you know, said that he would be presenting this topic because. It's a kind of a new topic uh, in nephrology, and it's a subspecialty in nephrology, and mainly it deals with ultrasonography of kidneys, um, ultrasound-guided you know, biopsies, uh, insertion of peritoneal dialysis catheters, tunnel dialysis catheters, and percutaneous endovascular procedures performed to manage dysfunction of AV fistulas or graft in end stage kidney disease. So uh, this is very, very important topic uh, for nephrology and nephrology in the world, uh, because traditionally these uh, procedures have been delegated to different specialties. For example, in Africa, and specifically in Tanzania, we normally delegate these procedures to vascular surgeons. And this actually tends to delay the procedures and delay the initiation of uh, treatment and diagnosis to our patients. So this, uh, I mean, subspecialty in our setting, it helps a lot in the diagnosis and initiation of therapy. So I'm very happy and excited to, uh, to, to, to introduce to you Dr. Garav Saga, uh, for the introduction on. So um, Dr. Garav or Dr. Saga is a senior consultant Nephrologist, Department of Nephrology and Renal tr uh, Transplant in the Indra Pratha, Indra Pratha, Apollo Hospital. <clears throat> he specializes in, in interventional nephrology, vascular access, catheterization, uh, renal transplant, clinical care and nephrology, and research. So he has been involved uh, in over 1,500 renal transplants including ABO incompatible transplants. Uh, he's also in clinical care nephrology, management of acid-based disorders, and electrolyte imbalance in, in, in particular. He's also involved in interventional nephrology, performing angioplasty and stenting of occluded fistulas and central venous catheter. He's a lead member of AVATA. AVATA is Association of Vascular Access and Interventional Renal Physicians. So I'm happy and delighted to welcome Dr. Gaurav Saga to take us through uh, the topic of introduction to interventional nephrology. You're welcome, Dr. Saga. The floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful words and for the kind invitation. My thanks to Dr. Rudin, uh, Lloyd also for this invitation. And I'm indeed grateful to the American sorry, the African Network, Healthcare Network for this invite. So uh, I'll be speaking today on overview of intervention nephrology. Whatever I am going to show now is all done at our hospital, Apollo Hospital, Delhi. So I'll be discussing basically about the overview of procedures which are being done at our hospital. And I will be presenting, if time permits, I'll be presenting a demonstration it's a recorded demonstration of retrograde and anti-grade tunnel dialysis catheter insertion. So uh, while presentation, if I, I think if you want to be, it can be an informal sort of discussion. If you want, you can sort of raise your hand and questions can be asked as, as and when required. So as we all know, intervention nephrology is growing as a subspeciality of nephrology. 
and there are so many patients who are living longer on dialysis it's very common nowadays to see patients who are living on dialysis for 10 years or 15 years and as more and more patients are living longer on dialysis the interventions in nephrology are also growing in our country there are very few centers who are providing dedicated fellowship or training in intervention nephrology and i'm sure back home in african in the african continent also the intervention nephrology programs would be very limited and as you rightly said when these patients who require nephrology care they go to a vascular surgeon or to other surgeons who are creating a fistula for them it is actually not a very important surgery and the purpose to develop this speciality is to prevent fragmentation of medical responsibilities so that there is very minimal inconvenience to the patients otherwise they have to run to different hospitals they have to run to different specialities and it's actually very painful for the patient then so uh, when it comes to intervention nephrology what all interventions are we doing in our hospital so we are creating our own vascular accesses which includes av fistulas it's a multi speciality hospital so the vascular surgeon is also doing the fistulas here the transplant surgeon is also doing and even the nephrologists are also doing but i strongly believe it's the nephrologist who has to take lead in intervention nephrology because it's the nephrologist who is going to, i'm sorry i hope there are no surgeons in this presentation otherwise <laughs> they'll not like it but what what is important it's it's important for the nephrologist to connect to the patients because long term he has to be the pillar in the care of the patient so as far as the creation of vascular access is concerned we are doing our fistulas we are doing our tunnel dialysis catheters we used to be doing about a decade ago av shunts also but which are now obsolete and yes there are few cases of av graft also but primarily the av grafts are being done by the vascular surgeons and not by the nephrologists there are vascular access interventions which we are doing in the cath lab these are interventions for dysfunctional fistula for pseudo aneurysms or they may be because of pre, uh, delayed maturation of accesses and another important complication of catheters is the central venous stenosis and we do management of central venous stenosis also all our biopsies kidney biopsies are real time kidney biopsies which are ultrasound guided kidney biopsies we are also doing trans jugular kidney biopsies the capd the peritoneal dialysis catheter insertion is also done in our hospital but unfortunately in our hospital it the peritoneal dialysis program is not very active it's more of a hemodialysis program but yes of course we have been trained to do a percutaneous capd catheter insertion also and we are also monitoring and doing surveillance of our vascular access and important which is now coming up as dr kobe rightly suggested is the role of ultrasound in nephrology ultrasound i think has come up in a big way in nephrology back home in our country we have some limitations to use ultrasound because of the some acts because of the pndt act but ultrasound i believe is going to be the stethoscope in future for any physician ultrasound is really important as far as nephrology is concerned and there is a special program which is called point of care of ultrasound and nephrology which is available if you go through the if you google it so why is it important that a vascular access should be created by a nephrologist because the nephrologist understands the importance of the vascular access and hence it is an important surgery for him but whereas for most surgeons av fistula is of least priority and a less rewarding surgery in our hospital also when we are asking the surgeon to do the fistula he will put it down the list and it would be done late night and sometimes the surgeon is just asking his associate to do it so creation of vascular access by the nephrologist really helps to create a good rapport with the patient in the long run also so many nephrologists in our country create an av fistula there are quite a number of nephrology fellowship programs not the intervention nephrology programs but the nephrology fellowship programs that train fellows to create av fistulas and i personally feel that once you have done around 20 to 25 av fistula your confidence grows you know how to handle the pain how the artery has to be handled delicately and how the anastomosis has been done so once you have done around 20 to 25 av fistula i think you become more confident to do fistulas independently so this is a study which was done by dr bala subramanian metal in which around 1900 av fistulas over 18 years were studied versus 600 fistulas by the surgeons the end to side configuration was the predominant fistula which was done and there was a high success rate of around 94% versus 96% which was done by the surgeons 
So this study clearly provided the much needed evidence that AV fistula creation by nephrologists in India is feasible and provides comparable outcome. So as I said before, if you do around 20 fistulas under the guidance of somebody who's doing it, then you get a hang of it and then you become more and more confident in doing it. So this uh, was the potency rate which we checked in our hospital, which was the fistula which were done by the nephrologist. So the primary potency was around 74% for radiocephalic versus 83% for brachiocephalic. The potency rates for primary assisted fistulas were around 78% and 85% compared to secondary potency, which was 80% and 87%. So which was not bad actually. Uh, as more and more patients are getting dialysis, the endovascular interventions for vascular access are also increasing in numbers. Patients are living longer and it is, it is not a surprise that 25 to 30 percent admissions of dialysis patients are due to vascular access problems and here is the importance of intervention nephrology. You, you must have also experienced that there are patients in dialysis who are getting dialysis for years together, who don't have any problems, who don't even come and see you. If these patients have a good fistula, dialysis can go on smoothly for years. But if people have problems with vascular access, that is a time when they need hospitalizations. That is a time when they get inadequate dialysis and other complications like infections, <coughs> cardiac issues because of fluid overload. So I would say the fistula is a lifeline of a dialysis patients. And if we have a good fistula, dialysis can go on for years. So this is, is this picture clear? Is this yes, picture it's, clear? It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very clear. Very good. So this is the classical angiogram, which is showing juxta anastomotic stenosis. Just around the anastomosis, you can see that the vein is stenosed right here. So this is a common cause of delayed maturation of AV fistula also, commonly seen in diabetics, obese, females. This is a very common scenario. So for most of our patients, before doing an angiogram, we do a Doppler. We have the advantage that there is a fellow in our nephrology department who has been trained for Doppler. So most of the interventions, prior to most of the interventions and even prior to creating AV fistulas, we do a Doppler. So Doppler helps us to decide from where we have to access the vein so that we can uh, delineate the anatomy which we want properly. So sometimes you may have to go through the femoral vein to take an angiogram, but most of the times, you can take an angiogram shot by introducing a catheter into the body of the AV fistula. So Doppler is really essential. And I strongly believe that for our nephrology fellowship programs, our fellows should be trained at least for two to three months in ultrasound. In the coming years, as nephrology practice is changing, I think training in ultrasound is equally important to be a competent nephrologist. So once you see this angiogram, what you do is you balloon. So with the balloon, you can do an angioplasty and then this is what you get. Of course, there are different potency rates of these procedures. Sometimes they last for three months, sometimes they last for six months, but sometimes they last for years together also. It is very difficult to predict how long after this balloon angioplasty, the patient would have a good fistula, but yes, it does preserve the venous estate. The whole, the whole concept is that we try to preserve these veins as long as we can so that the patient continues to have dialysis for years together. So this is a very classical case where there is juxta anastomotic anastomosis and through the body of the fistula, the puncture is done, the, it is ballooned and this is what you get. Again, a very common problem. This is the cephalic arch. So whenever we have a dysfunctional AV fistula, it's always important to see the cephalic arch also. It's very common that there is a stenosis of the cephalic arch because of which there is venous hypertension, because of which there is poor flows. So whenever we do, uh, whenever we create our fistula, we generally look for the cephalic arch, cephalic arch also. On Doppler, it is not easy to examine the cephalic arch, but yes, if you have an angiogram, it makes it more easy. So for similarly for this patient, again, a balloon angioplasty, although it was a long segment was done and we could get the desirable results. Again, this picture again shows that there is juxta anastomotic stenosis. This is the site and you can see there is some stenosis here also, but more important is that it should be more than 50% of the vein diameter. If the size of the vein is more than 50%, then it becomes significant. 
again angioplasty with the balloon so whenever you are doing an angioplasty whenever a balloon is inserted if you see this thing this is called the waist so this is the point where there is maximum stenosis and once this is done <coughs> sorry once this is done then you get a good flows now what is important is uh, that whenever we are starting these procedures it's always better to have a cardiologist who are doing coronary angiograms who are who are playing with balloons who are doing angioplasties in and out it's always better to start your learning curve with a cardiologist because they are able to manage any complications also so it's always important when you are starting to do these procedures it's better to do in the cath lab under the supervision of a cardiologist so in our hospital also i'm sure it would be a problem everywhere in the world that the cath lab belongs to the cardiologist that is his domain so we have to sort of squeeze our time through we have to go in and if you have to learn interventions you have to do them at all times you have to invite the cardiologist this is what has to be there in the learning curve of uh, intervention nephrology now sometimes we also do an angio now this is a lady who came to us with swelling in the left upper limb so we were suspecting that probably she has central venous stenosis and so we did an angio for this lady so here you can see this is the catheter which is there in the this is a, this is called a four french five french catheter which is introduced into the vein with the help of ultrasound guidance and through this dye is inserted and you can see that there is a good anastomosis a very good anastomosis no stenosis a good segment of the vein which is there which is actually a big size vein on doppler this lady had a flows of around 1800 ml per minute and so whenever you are doing an angiogram in such a case you always look at the central veins also so here you can see the central vein is clean so probably this lady was having a hyperdynamic fistula and there was no central venous stenosis so we just told her that she has to continue this thing could have been done on doppler also but um, assessing the central veins on doppler can sometimes be difficult and this lady was very concerned about the growing swelling in the left upper limb and that's the reason an angio was done this way we ruled out stenosis also and we ruled out any significant problem in the fistula so this is where also angiograms and interventional nephrology helps us now this is an important concept which has been coming up see um, as i told you the cath lab is the domain of the cardiologist and sometimes it may not be possible to get the lab it may be difficult so over the years this was actually started by the vascular surgeon at our hospital and you can also do an ultrasound guided angioplasty on an opd basis so the advantage of an ultrasound guided angioplasty is that you don't need a cath lab you don't need a fluoroscope so the radiation is gone for peripheral angiograms there is lot of radiation exposure which the physician has to bear so if you are able to do an ultrasound guided angioplasty the radiation exposure is gone the cost of the procedure goes down the patient can be done this procedure can be done on an outpatient basis so but yes you have to be well versed with the doppler if you really have to do an ultrasound guided angioplasty but this is also something which is not difficult if you can learn ultrasound and if you know how to handle balloons it's very important to do this procedure especially in av grafts in av grafts it is very easy to do an ultrasound guided angioplasty and these grafts even if they are occluded for weeks say about 2 or 3 weeks then also it is possible to open them but yes if a fistula is occluded for a longer duration out a week or 10 days then it may be difficult to salvage the fistula so this is a doppler finding which is showing that there is this is the anastomosis and you can see there is a stenosis when you compare am i am i visible is this fine yes 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 fine fine so this is the stenosis again just an anastomotic stenosis just next to the body of the av fistula next to the anastomosis now when you do the doppler of this there is a characteristic turbulence here which you can see this is what is called aliasing on doppler so this is high flow there is a high flow because of the stenosis and this that's the reason you see this color in this doppler now again for uh, for the angioplasty what you have to do is first of all under ultrasound guidance you have to puncture the vein 
with a micro puncture needle then you have to introduce the wire which is also visualized on doppler this is actually the catheter with the balloon <coughs> which has crossed the stenosis so this is where the stenosis is it has crossed the stenosis so all these things are visualized on ultrasound provided you have the skills for it doppler is not difficult but i think if you spend about half an hour daily on doing doppler av fistulas in about 3 months time you can really be an expert it's just that you need somebody's guidance and you have to persist you have to do it daily half an hour you have to commit yourself in doing a doppler and that's the reason i say that all nephrology fellows i think it's important that they should be dedicated 3 months to ultrasound training so that in future we all can be good interventionists so now you can see this has been ballooned the angioplasty has been done and the stenosis has disappeared and this is what is the end result this is actually very gratifying doesn't take too long and you can take the patient right from your opd back to the dialysis unit it doesn't cost also much and of course <coughs> the radiation exposure also is less in this patients so this is a similar case there this you can see the catheter around the stenotic part this is the stenotic part this you can see again the doppler where the stenosis is there the this is again this portion is the stenotic stenotic part and you can see the appreciate the this is actually basically about doppler flows which i'll not go into the details about this but yes it is possible to do ultrasound guided angioplasties as well and here you can see the stenotic segment is all gone so this is the catheter which is there inside the inside the vein and over this catheter you have to inflate the balloon the catheter has to be passed over the wire so the dictum the principle remains the same first of all the wire goes in then the catheter then the exchange catheter over that the balloon you do angioplasty angioplasty again is a different um, i would say a topic that is a long topic hardware which is basically on hardware of uh, angioplasty and this is what the end result is so this was a small study which we did in our hospital and which was presented this was duplex guided angioplasty of vascular access and its short term patency in 18 months around 24 doppler guided angioplasty procedures were done in 20 patients 12 patients with av fistula and 8 with av grafts failing vascular access with poor flows was the sole indication in these patients and good short term patency at 3 and 6 months was judged by adequacy of dialysis so now coming to the tunnel dialysis catheter which i would say is my own personal liking also and i really enjoy doing the tunnel dialysis catheters so i have done around 350 tunnel dialysis catheter in last 60 months the procedural complications have been there in 13 patients 12 patients had minimal losing but yes one of the patient had significant bleeding after about 2 days but most of these bleedings settled down with pressure dressings in one patient the catheter had ruptured the vein and was lying in the mediastinum and had to be removed functional status at the end of 3 months was 100% and in only one patient the catheter had to be removed before 90 days in view of catheter related blood stream infection now i'll be discussing uh, these are certain images pertaining to the tunnel dialysis catheters and when we see central venous stenosis this is a classic angiogram of central venous stenosis where you can see the dye is coming down it is you have entered through the femoral vein this is the catheter through which you have injected the dye and this is showing that this this vein is obliterated now uh, this is again the same patient <coughs> when we were doing the angiogram um this patient had features of central venous stenosis had collaterals on its chest wall also so this is basically a picture of an angiogram where you have a peripheral cannula on the wrist and you are injecting dye so once the dye is injected it goes to the subclavian which is blocked and it sort of passes into the collaterals again a similar picture uh, the picture the same patient you can see this is a web of collaterals which has been formed and so we were trying to do the dialysis catheter the tunnel dialysis catheter for this patient and he had all collaterals this patient actually was on peritoneal dialysis had developed fungal peritonitis <coughs> sorry had developed fungal peritonitis and uh, we were forced to do hemodialysis he had come for a renal transplant and his uh, left sided femoral vein was also blocked the right femoral vein we wanted to preserve for transplant but all this angio shots were taken from the right femoral vein because all the veins in the neck were blocked and he had all collateral flows so fortunately for us we could uh, puncture the left internal jugular vein and when an angio shot so when we puncture the internal jugular vein we put in a, a catheter and through that we taken it's a small catheter which the cardiologist used 
it's a five frames catheter so uh, through that an angio shot was taken and this is what we were getting so this looks like the left internal jugular vein but if we see carefully it was actually a very big collateral so you can see this collaterals and how do we know that this was a collateral because it was going down the diaphragm the same vein is going down the diaphragm and from the diaphragm all the flow is coming upward so it was actually a huge collateral which we had entered so if you take a lateral picture of this then you realize that yes it is not the internal jugular vein it is actually a collateral which we had entered <coughs> but for us we did the we thought that since it's a huge collateral why not try to do the tunnel dialysis catheter into this vein itself and we could finally access the collateral this is the catheter going inside the collateral and this is what the final picture was so this patient could it's not a very good position of the tip of the catheter but yes we could get flows in a patient who had all occluded veins only the right femoral vein was there which was preserved for transplant in the future about 3 months back about 3 months later down the line he was given a transplant so this is an example of a tunnel dialysis catheter in a collateral which is possible now this lady who had a tunnel dialysis catheter again was being planned for a transplant she came to us for dysfunctional catheter flows so she didn't have she had very poor flows in the catheter so this is what we were getting so this is this is the azygous vein whenever you see a configuration like this this is the azygous vein so this patient again had a blocked svc and because of that the azygous vein had become prominent and she wasn't getting any flows but yes she was planned for transplant generally it takes about 4 to 6 weeks once the committee and all the formalities are over for transplant so we thought to give a dialysis what we did was we just took a longer femoral catheter and a femoral um, form cath which we call the femoral tunnel dialysis cuff catheter and we just extended it further so this is a tunnel dialysis catheter into the azygous vein so uh, in such a scenario whenever you are using a longer catheter and whenever you are pushing the catheter over the wire you should use what we call stiff wires so the cardiologists do it very often so if you use the normal wires which are available with the form cath or the tunnel dialysis catheters they are very soft they will bend if you use pressure so these catheters have to be pushed in over a stiff wire so this is basically a tunnel dialysis catheter in an azygous vein now uh, what all we do about these complication of tunnel dialysis catheter this is a ct film which is showing this patient also again came to us for a transplant and he was getting fever intermittent fever on dialysis so this was his second transplant and he was getting dialysis through this catheter and here you can see there is a big clot there is a thrombus which is clinging to the catheter so it's a huge clot and you can see this is the echo finding it's almost the size of a small table tennis a small uh, sorry a table tennis ball or a small tennis ball so uh, this patient was a very high risk for any endovascular intervention so we asked him that it would be best that he should undergo a surgery for removal of this clot because this could embolize to the pulmonary artery and cause pulmonary embolism any time but he was so reluctant that no he doesn't want a surgery so what we decided we took this ivc filter this is the ivc filter from bard and what we did was through the we entered the right femoral vein and through the right femoral vein this clot was plucked out but prior to that what is important is if you see uh, basically fluoroscopy is a two dimensional image so when you are doing this you should be sure that you are in the plane of the catheter so how to do that how to how to assess that you are in the same plane of the catheter so for that what we did was we introduced the wire through the through the perm cath through the tunnel dialysis catheter and that wire was snared out from the right groin so once once you are sure that you have entered the once you enter from the neck and you take out the wire from the groin by snaring it out you are sure that you are on the same plane and on that plane only this this ivc filter was introduced and then this clot was plucked out so important is that the wire it's possible to pass a wire from the 
catheter into the neck to the groin by a snare. And this is what we could take out. And finally, the patient improved, his fever settled down, and we could give him a transplant also. So what all, what, what is the other thing which we do in intervention nephrology is the management of central venous stenosis. Central venous stenosis is an important complication of catheters. And we all know that most of our patients, I would say about 30 to 35% of our patients would start dialysis on catheters, despite repeatedly counseling them that AV fistulas are an important modality. So this is the classical picture of a central venous stenosis where there are collaterals on the chest wall, the size of the hand where the fistula is disproportionately more. And you can see this is an old subclavian dialysis catheter which was put here. So there is central venous stenosis which is causing its collaterals and a disproportionately high, disproportionately increase in the size of the right upper limb. So as I had shown before, whenever we do an angiogram for such patients, this is what we get. There is an obliterated central vein and that's the reason the dye is not going up. Uh, this patient again, the catheter has been introduced through the right femoral vein. Now, yes. Now, if we do an angio for such a patient from the right upper limb, you can put in a peripheral cannula and push in contrast through the cannula. This is what you will see. There is a stenosis. There is stenosis of the SVC hair, all collateralized flows. And again, if you can appreciate, this is the azygous vein which is getting prominent, and probably this is the streak of SVC, SVC which is stenosis. So this is the SVC and this is the azygous vein, which is getting prominent because of the occluded SVC. And this is the selective angiography of the same portion. And you can see there is, this is a big clot. The spelling defect is because of the clot or a thrombus in the SVC. And so, so whenever you are doing these procedures, uh, whenever there is a stenotic lesion, you first of all have to pass the wire across that lesion. It may not be always possible to pass the wire across the lesion. And when such a scenario happens, we call it complete total occlusion, which is not, which is not plastible, not able to stent it. So this patient, we were able to pass the wire, the angioplasty was done, balloon angioplasty was done. And since there was a significant recoil after the angioplasty, whenever there is more than 50% recoil after the angioplasty, when you balloon the vessel, you do, you recheck the uh, size of the vessel by a check angio and if there is a recoil which is more than 50 percent you stent that vessel most of the times most of the time venous stenting is not required this is important um, for even for av fistula i it's a routine practice that we avoid stenting because if you do a stent you lose that portion of the vein which can be used for the fistula but yes for central veins Although stenting is not always required, but if there is a recoil more than 50%, or if the stenting, if the stenosis reoccurs after three months, within three months, then a stenting is required. So this patient, you can see the stenting is done. And as soon as the stenting is done, you can see the azygous and all the collaterals disappear. There is a good flow of the SVC, the azygous and all the other collaterals immediately disappear and the patient starts getting relief, the swelling also starts disappearing. And generally when we finish in the evening, tomorrow morning when we come and see the patient, they have a different face, the arm size is reduced considerably. So it is actually very gratifying. This is again an angio of a central vein. So what you can do is, this is from the fistula size. This patient has a fistula in the left upper limb and you can put in, through, again through a micropuncture needle, you can introduce a wire into the fistula and then a catheter, and then you can take an angio shot from there. Again, once you have identified these two, these two points you can see are of the balloon. This is the point where the balloon would be inflated. So once you identify the lesion, you inflate the balloon, and this is what you get. Can you see? Can you appreciate the flows now? Which were not there before. So see, the flows have been have come back now. But uh, having said this, these procedures sometimes take a lot of time. It is not always easy to pass. This video is basically showing how we introduce under ultrasound guidance, you, you are putting in a micropuncture needle here. Over here, you are putting in a micropuncture needle through ultrasound guidance. But uh, central venous stenosis management sometimes can be difficult because it's not always possible to pass the wire 
and sometimes even it can take about an hour or two before you can you come in the same plane and then you sometimes have to go from the femoral vein also from the upper limb left upper limb also and then try to be in the same plane the two wires are brought in the same plane and then we try to cross the lesion so it does take some persistence to do this procedure again this is uh, an angiogram of the central vein this patient had um, all features of uh, central venous stenosis and had a diffuse swelling of the left upper limb you can see a characteristic abrupt cut of air where there is a stenosis now as i was saying before sometimes it becomes if you could appreciate the previous slide it wasn't an easy stenosis to pass the wire through so you sometimes this is this is the catheter from the right groin and this is the uh, wire which is coming from the left upper limb so you have to try to be in the same plane slowly slowly you have to proceed and then you may be possible it may be possible to cross the wire now once you are able to cross the wire across across the lesion then you angioplasty you can see there whenever there is a base like this this is the portion where there is stenosis and here you can see now there was a complete total occlusion over here and now the dye is flowing so freely so this procedure also it, it, it although it takes about 20 seconds 30 seconds to show this procedure but it took about two and a half hours for this procedure it does take a lot of radiation exposure for the performer who is doing it so there's uh, one important case which i would like to discuss uh, with you so this uh, 24 year old female who had undergone renal transplant about 7 years back had again reached ncs disease and was started on hemodialysis to a left radio cephalic cap fistula outside so this girl at the time of getting transplant 7 years back had received two sessions of dialysis to a neck vein now through a dialysis a jugular dialysis catheter and now when she was started on dialysis she developed left sided pleural effusion and you could see that she had all features of central venous stenosis not a good picture but you can see the collaterals here a suffused face she had a fistula in the left upper limb brachiocephalic fistula and she came to us with paraparesis she had this chest x ray at presentation was breathless she was lifted by her father from the bed and was in a bad state actually when she when she came to us so outside she was uh, started on anti tuberculosis therapy att was started but then it was stopped they were assuming that paraparesis is probably because of inh but her symptoms were not improving so we repeated a ct scan that showed massive left sided pleural effusion and a contrast ct was done which showed abrupt cut off here if you can appreciate this is an abrupt cut off which is causing central venous stenosis so we thought that uh, let us at least try to do an angiogram from the left upper limb and try to open this vein as we have done in the previous case so but unfortunately if you see this picture there is a complete obliteration of the central vein the left brachiocephalic vein over here and this is all collateralized flows which we were getting and unfortunately for this girl we were not able to cross the wire across this lesion so whenever this happens that you are not able to open a lesion a central stenotic lesion it's always better that you close the fistula on the same side it's a high flow av fistula and because of the stenosis here it causes more problems and it actually doesn't doesn't cause adequate dialysis also can cause pleural effusions like in this female which we have presented to us so we decided that we will close the fistula in the left upper limb and we in the same setting we did an angiogram on the right side also we saw that the right subclavian vein also was not of very good caliber so but fortunately for us we could cross the wire across the right subclavian vein this if you can see is a stent which was placed in the right subclavian vein this was done because we had plans to close the fistula in the left upper limb so for dialysis access we will be creating a new fistula in the right upper limb so that at least she could continue with dialysis but to our surprise four days after the closure of the left brachiocephalic fistula this was a this was a chest x ray so that high flow av fistula in the left upper limb was causing significant central venous stenosis pressures and this you can see carefully is a stent which was placed in the right subclavian and you won't believe two weeks later she was able to walk also with minimum support so i am presenting this case just to show you that patients with central venous stenosis can have all sorts of problems we've seen patients with paraparesis we've seen patients with uncontrolled blood pressures pleural effusions 
not able to get proper dialysis. So it's very important to manage patients who have centrovenous stenosis. And if nothing can be done, it's always advisable to close the fistula on the side which the patient is having uh, the centrovenous stenosis. So this is the, basically some small videos of the kidney biopsies which we are doing. All our kidney biopsies we are doing it ourselves. No intervention radiologist or no nobody else is involved. All patients' kidney biopsies are being done by the nephrologist in our hospital. And but they are all real-time kidney biopsies. This is just to show that local anesthesia is being given. And again, if you are able to, if you have a good hand of ultrasound, if you have a good hand of ultrasound, it is always easy to perform kidney biopsies. This is how the real-time, sorry. This is the real-time kidney biopsies which we are performing. So all kidney biopsies, most of the kidney biopsies in our hospital are done as an OPD basis. We admit the patient at, in daycare and about four to six hours, if there is no bleeding and the patient is hemodynamically stable, we generally send them away. So, but all kidney biopsies are done under real-time ultrasound as I have shown you here. To begin with, um, sometimes you will use the longitudinal axis of, to do the biopsies, but I always find that the transverse axis when you're doing a biopsy is easier. In our hospitals, we have done few trans jugular kidney biopsies also. So these are patients who basically have a bleeding risk and these patients can undergo a trans jugular kidney biopsy. In our hospital, we have a very active liver transplant program as well. So many a times we are asked by the liver transplant surgeons or the hepatologists whether the patient needs a combined liver kidney transplant. So in that scenario, a trans jugular kidney biopsy in these patients is important because most of these patients have a deranged INR, they will have thrombocytopenia. So although I don't have much experience, but yes, transcular biopsies have been done. Not many, but yes, few have been done. So this was about, uh, this was about the 42 year old male patient who had undergone a double wall replacement, was an anticoagulation. He presented with active kidney sediments and he was referred to us by the rheumatologist for a kidney biopsy. So we decided that we will do a transcular kidney biopsy in this patient. In transular kidney biopsy, again, uh, what you have to do is, first of all, you have to introduce the wire under fluoroscopic guidance. Basically, the process remains the same. First of all, you have to introduce the wire. And this, this you can see is the sheath which I was talking about, the catheter, small catheter to which you can uh, give dye. And now this is the wire which is being introduced. Now this is the uh, transjugular kidney biopsy needle which is available from Cook. So this is sort of, uh, this, this has a scissor-like thing and you just have to press it so that it can take the biopsy. I will show you. But everything has to be done under fluoroscopic guidance. This has to be done in the cath lab under fluoroscopic guidance. Now, you see, uh, this is first of all the stainless steel catheter which is inside. Over this, there is a smaller flexible catheter and through this, the needle is going inside. So the whole needle goes inside and under fluoroscopic guidance, you can see this. When, if, could you hear the sound? So this is the transjugular kidney biopsy, which we have done. So in, uh, in the last year, we did about three transjugular kidney biopsies, but uh, the liver transplant unit, I'm sure is doing more because uh, they, along with the cardiologist, are doing much more kidney biopsies, transjugular kidney biopsies compared to our unit. Now, uh, as I said before, in our hospital, we have limited patients on peritoneal dialysis, but uh, yes, we are trained to do 3D catheters also under ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance. This is basically uh, some pictures which I have shown the insertion of the CAPD catheter. This is just below the umbilicus, a stab wound is done. And with the help of this various needle, you enter the peritoneum. So you can use the fluoroscope for confirming the position of the wire also whether you're in the peritoneum or not. Generally, we do not have this practice of filling up the abdomen before doing the procedure, but sometimes a uh, few nephrologists do instill about uh, 500 to 1 liter of normal line into the peritoneal cavity so that the chances of bowel injury are minimized. So once the needle is inside, you put this wire through the various needle. The principle remains the same. And so over the wire, you put in the dilators, and then there's a peel apart sheath through which the catheter is put in. 
and i will be showing some video recording of the tunnel analysis catheter which will become, which will make this more clear and then this is tunneled out so this is basically few pictures of the capd catheter insertion uh, i have i don't have any videos about doppler but as i said before doppler is an important modality which i think must be incorporated in nephrology training programs and most of our patients most of the patients we try to interventions we try to do an ultrasound and even for kidney biopsies you need an ultrasound for access dysfunction for creating an iv fistula and even for puncturing the vein central veins you need doppler so i think it's important that we should all sort of try to incorporate ultrasound training in our nephrology programs thank you all for your kind patience and if you permit now i can show a recorded demonstration of a tunnel dialysis catheter okay thank you for, thank you thank you for your presentation uh, yes you can show us right right so i just stop yes. share for a minute okay okay so uh, generally once uh, we put in the wire we confirm the position of the wire and the wire has to be into the ivc this is an important dictum because if the wire is in the ivc you are sure that you are in the venous channel one and second you are sure in the you are in the venous channel second the risk of arrhythmia is less and third the wire always gives some sort of support when you are doing when you are entering with the dilators and doing the dilatation process uh the dilatation process is the is the time when most of the complications happen so at that time you really have to be careful it has to be done under fluoroscopic guidance so this is basically a demonstration of the retrograde tunnel dialysis catheter which i am doing in the retrograde tunnel dialysis catheter you first of all access the vein put in the wire under ultrasound guidance and so once the wire is inside you can see the wire is inside here it's always important at the site of venotomy you dissect the tissue i always do this step because if you dissect the tissue the catheter sticks comfortably and it doesn't cause kinks ultimately it's that ultimately the important thing is to get good flows there should be any kinks so we always try to puncture the vein as low down as possible so this is also helpful when you are using ultrasound doing this procedure when you use ultrasound we try to go as close to the clavicle one and second we enter the vein from the lateral aspect so when you enter the vein from the lateral aspect it gets a smooth curve so that the kinks are not there and this step which i find is very important especially when the patient has had multiple punctures or there is fibrosis in the neck you have to you must dissect around this side so that the catheter uh, sits comfortably so once the wire is inside you have dissected around the notmy side you use the dilators the dilatation again has to be done under fluoroscopic guidance it's important that dilators when you are doing the dilatation process the wire should be slightly there should be some tension in the wire that means you should slightly pull it with your left hand and then do the dilatation process so once the dilatation has been done what you do is you put in the catheter so in the retrograde technique you put in the catheter first and then you create the tunnel when you're outside so what is what is the advantage of this retrograde catheter is that you can change the tip of the catheter to be in the right atrium the tip of the catheter has to be in the middle of right atrium so once once the catheter is inside what we'll do is yeah this is this is showing the picture that the catheter is going inside this is the catheter which has been clamped by this venous clamp and this you can see the catheter is going inside and once the catheter is inside the peel apart sheath you pull it away yeah so you pull apart the peel apart sheath and the sheath is pulled out now we have a catheter which has which is inside we check the position on the fluoroscope on fluoroscope it the catheter tip has to be in the middle of right atrium how do you decide that that it has to be the half vertebrae below the carina on fluoroscope you can see the vertebrae you can see the trachea so two and a half vertebrae below the carina is the tip of the uh is the middle of the right atrium and that is where the tip of the catheter has to be so now once the catheter inside you take this venous clamp just next to the skin this is the cuff if you can appreciate we clamp the catheter here and then we will create the tunnel so you measure you measure 
measure the, the you keep the catheter on the chest wall you measure where exactly you want the exit point to be but wherever you want the exit point you have to be and you have to be sure that this curve is very smooth and there are no kinks sorry so once you decide that this is going to be your exit point you give a stab incision with a blade and from this point you put in the tunneler this tunneler is pushed in and has to be guided towards the venotomy site it has to be guided towards here and now you, here you can see the tunneler was entered from the exit point and from here the tunneler has from the venotomy site it has come out and on this uh, at this point we will hook on the catheter so here i am attaching the tip of the catheter to the end of the tunneler and then i will pull it back so here you can see the catheter has been taken out and this was the original venotomy site this is the exit point and this is the catheter coming out so basically in the retrograde technique what we have done is we have first of all introduced the catheter into the vein and then later we have from inside to outside we have created the tunnel retrograde technique has an advantage which i'll tell you and now what we do is we clamp we clamp this catheter and depending on how much we need we cut the catheter with the scissor and onto this onto the cut portion over here the catheter hubs are attached these hubs are available with the catheter and onto this you screw the hubs onto the catheter and then you finally confirm the position of the catheter and here you see that you are getting good flows and briefly i'll be demonstrating the anti grade catheter insertion also so again under ultrasound guidance you are inserting the wire the wire please ensure that the wire has to go into the ivc because by doing that you minimize the risk of arrhythmias and you ensure that you are in the venous channel so once the wire is in the ivc then you keep the catheter on the chest wall to see where exactly the exit point has to be so you keep the catheter on this is the um, palindrome catheter which is available from mahurkar which i am using for the anti grade technique so once the wire is inside you keep the catheter this is the cuff of the catheter you can see you keep the catheter on the chest wall so that you know where exactly the exit point has to be from where you can give the local anesthesia so once the local anesthesia is given so in this anti grade technique we do the tunneling prior to introducing the catheter now as i said before this step is extremely important around the venotomy side you must give a small incision and dissect all the fibrous tissue which is there so that the catheter goes inside without any kinks and if you can notice we are quite down compared to the conventional puncture sites again ultrasound is really helpful in doing this lower puncture so as i was saying must dissect around the wire so that it sits comfortably and once we have done this what we do is we hook on the tip of the catheter the catheter tip is hooked on to the tunneler so this is the tunneler and i have hooked the catheter to the tunneler and i'll be entering the subcutaneous tissue from the exit side and we can do this so that the uh, there is no resistance while you are doing the tunneling so generally what i do is i bend the tunneler slightly so that it helps to sort of give some leverage while you are pushing it because this step requires some pressure some force when you are doing it so i am entering from the exit side the tunneler is going there and it would be directed towards the venotomy site and from here we will take out the tunneler you can see if you can appreciate the tunneler is coming out and with some pull and push you can ask your assistant with some pull and push we take out the catheter from the other side now this is an important thing this is the peel apart sheath which is available with the catheter and this peel apart sheath has a unilateral valve from where you can you can put in the dilator but yes the blood wouldn't come out so it's a unilateral valve you close this valve you lock this valve put in the dilator through this valve and then lock it up so all these things are available with the set there are two dilators this peel apart sheath the guide wire the introducer needle
and then you lock it up. So as I said before, this is the first dilator which is going. The dilatation process also has to be done under fluoroscopic guidance. Please remember this is the most important step. But generally, if when you are doing this process, you can ask your assistant to give some pressure on the wire. Some they can pull it slightly so that there is no the wire doesn't kink. And all dilatation has to be done under fluoroscopic guidance. Now the catheter is also inside. You see the catheter, the dilatation has been done with the two dilators and we have introduced the sheath also, the peel apart sheath also. Now we'll take out the peel apart sheath is also inside. We'll take out the dilator and the wire along with it. And into the peel apart sheath, we put in the catheter. The same process we do for CAPD catheter also. There is a peel apart sheath and through that the catheter is put inside. And once you are doing this, once you are putting in the catheter, you check it, check the position on the fluoroscope. And now you have to peel it apart with both your fingers, pull it apart and press downwards. So when you are doing this step, it's important when you are pulling apart the sheath, your index finger should be on the catheter so that it doesn't migrate out while pulling it apart. And then you confirm the final position of the catheter. There shouldn't be any kinks and you get a good flow and then you suture the catheter. Yeah, it's important that especially at the venotomy site where we had dissected the tissue, you must suture. The, the, these, are the, these are the points which generally bleed after the procedure. So you have to give some pressure on the venotomy site. And here, uh, as you could see, the, uh, the position is two and a half vertebrae below the carina. So if this is the carina, one, two, two and a half vertebrae below the carina, then you are sure that you are in the middle of the right atrium. Now, what are the advantages of doing a retrograde versus anti-grade? I find that the, the tip of this catheter is extremely important to give good flows. And I find when the patient has had multiple punctures, there is fibrosis in the neck or there is an obese patient, retrograde offers a better tip advantage. Mm -hmm. And especially in patients uh, who have central venous stenosis and the vessels are stented, again, retrograde dialysis catheters Retrograde tunnel analysis catheters offer better advantage compared to the. Uh, good evening, Dr. Dr. Swani. Yes, uh, Dr. Silvan, good evening. Good Dr. Aguina, good evening. Just, Dr. Swani, you, thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. You're welcome. You can just present yourself and then introduce yourself and then uh, ask a question. Yes, Dr. Silvan. I am Dr. Amar Swani. I'm a fellow of the International Society of Nephrology, currently in Tanzania. I returned recently. Uh, Dr. Sagar, thank you for the for the presentation. And uh, my only question is, uh, in a setting where we do not have a C arm uh, uh, for tunnel catheters, uh, uh, in the past, before the C arm system was introduced, uh, what system uh, was being used, and what would you advise us uh, for those people who are going to do procedures without a C arm? Thank you a good question but honestly i would not advise doing tunnel dialysis catheters without a cm there are many centers who are doing it but uh, if you are trying to be an intervention nephrologist the learning curve is always there and at the beginning of the learning curve if there are complications then i'm sure you will be discouraged to do it so cm is a uh, cm is not a big thing nowadays you can go to the orthopedic opd cm is available everywhere but yes, the problem is you'll have to begin to begin with. You'll have to do it at odd hours, I'm sure. But to be an interventionist, you have to go through all these things. But please, it's my sincere advice that uh, we should not be doing interventions, tunnel dialysis catheters, uh, without fluoroscopic guidance. And especially if the dilatation. And one more, one more important thing: uh, when you are doing these tunnel dialysis catheters, you start with the right-sided procedures. Only once you have done about eight to 10 right-sided procedures, you should attempt a left-sided one. Left-sided, there is always there are always two curves. Uh, first is the, when you enter the brachiocephalic, and then there is an anterior curve also. So please 
if even if you are doing without fluoroscope i would advise that please don't do a left sided procedure mm. without you, you may be successful in doing a right sided but please don't do a left sided procedure left sided tunnel analysis catheter without a fluoroscope thank you dr saga thank you very much the, i can see professor uh, where uh, mic is open uh, thanks for that uh, excellent presentation uh, it's very educational um dr anthony were uh, from kenya the east african kidney institute uh, some of my students have an interest in taking up uh, interventional nephrology uh, could you give us a structure to the training and what is the situation in Tanz in in india do you expose every fellow to this or is it only those who are interested and those who are interested are they uh do they take up uh, a different structure of training what is your advice in this regard uh, 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 um, garo uh, uh, professor vere is uh, is the president of afran and he's got a great training program in kenya so it is his request yes sir sure thank you sir for the nice words and uh, intervention nephrology training programs are not here in india also there are very very few centers i can recollect only one or two centers who are doing some sort of um, structured training in intervention nephrology there are few centers um, in india who are training their nephrology colleagues the nephrology fellows fellows for creating an av fistula but this sort of extensive intervention nephrology program uh, only cmc velor is offering but yes we have our foundation also which is run by the name called avatar this is association of vascular access and training in intervention nephrology so we do invite fellows for training in intervention nephrology but yes uh, a dedicated program as of now is not available and even our fellows are not exposed to this type of presentation which i have done this has to be i i have gathered it over years it has taken about 3 to 5 years to learn these and i feel to begin with you have to sort of uh, associate yourself with a cardiologist you will get cath lab at different odd hours so it's not an easy thing but yes it's an important subspecialty which is coming up and i think we all should be working towards it that is what i can say um uh, but if the residents in your country they are really interested they can visit www.avatar.net.in they can drop in their mails and there are a lot of presentations on that site where they can see tunnel analysis catheter cbd catheter insertions and a lot of access interventions on that site so this is a this is sort of a, a training module which we have tried to create but yes it is still not as uh, an official or what can i say a licensed training program uh one quick question uh is there uh, any way that you know uh, uh, somebody can visit from india and hold workshops here in africa now covid of course is there but i'm saying at some point in time what would you say dr garo yes it can be done sir but i would suggest that uh, anybody who is really interested in intervention nephrology they must visit the avatar site also and of course yes. we can we can come over we do conduct workshops also about we were doing till last year we were doing workshops once in 3 months where yeah. we used to give an exposure to people who are interested in intervention nephrology it used yeah. to be a two days cath lab workshop where we'll show angiographies we show angioplasty also management of central venous stenosis and of course we do the tunnel analysis catheter as well and uh, dr santosh varges also had come over and he had demonstrated cpd catheter insertion at our institute so we do conduct workshops and if people from countries african countries are interested of course they would be they, they are most welcome but uh, they'll have to register once this covid problem gets over i am not sure how long it would take but about a year ago so till december 2019 we were conducting workshops once in 3 months Oh, wonderful! Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, is there another question? Um, maybe I can ask uh, uh, yeah. one one question. Yes. So, um, for the central venous stenosis, um, apart from the ballooning and stenting, 
you know, what else can you do? Is there any uh, like conservative treatment that can help? Because I've seen these patients at least two in, in, in our setting, but then because of uh, lack of resources, we end up doing nothing. So is there any, any uh, you, know, con, con, you know, something that is not uh, stenting or ballooning that can be done to these patients and help? Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question, sir. Uh, first of all, all central venous stenosis, it's very common to see central venous stenosis in dialysis patients because of catheters and because of the cephalic arch. But all central venous stenosis, which are asymptomatic and which are not causing any problems, should be left alone, first of all. Only once they are causing significant problems like pleural effusions, uh, inability to do dialysis, uncontrolled blood pressures, only then one should intervene. Second, as I said before, if there is lack of resources, then it's a good idea if the fistula is on the same side of the central venous stenosis, you close the fistula on that arm and make a new one on the right side or the other arm. So this also helps in significant elevation of symptoms. Surgeries for central venous stenosis is a long procedure when you try, a, try to do a bypass and causes a lot of morbidities. So I think the recommended treatment for central venous stenosis, if they are symptomatic and if they require treatment, is endovascular. Again, I think uh, we can approach the cardiologists in our countries, and uh, I'm sure for a cardiologist to do a central vein, it is not that difficult, provided we are able to convince that, yes, what exactly we want out of them. But surgical treatment for central venous stenosis carries a lot of comorbidities, uh, sorry, morbidities. And it, in, gen, in that, generally, they make a bypass and uh, most of the dialysis patients do not tolerate these surgeries. But if there is no option available, it's best to close the fistula on the same side. Right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The uh, ultrasound-guided angioplasty, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, 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 what sort of training would be required for that? Uh, one is learning the ultrasound. And second is insertion of this, uh, the, you know, the balloon is also another bit of training that is needed, right? So probably you need a cardiologist to help you to, to learn on that as well, because that yes, doesn't need all this cath lab and everything like that. Exactly, sir. That is what ultrasound guided angioplasty is something which uh, we should try to invest in because uh, that doesn't require too many skill and importantly, uh, it does, since we are in the veins, when you are in the veins, the risk of rupture also is less compared to when you are in the arteries, which are more stiff. The only thing is that you, you should have a surgeon, in case there is a rupture, he should be able to help you. But yes, for ultrasound, you should have knowledge about hardware. Hardware, which is being used in cath lab, which is the exchange wire, the balloons, what sort of balloons are available, and entering a vein through Entering a vein, the fistula vein, through a micropuncture needle is not difficult. That is very easy. Uh, you just have to feel the vein, put in the needle, just like you do a cannulation of the AV fistula, put in a wire through that, and put in a small four French sheath. So entering the vein is not difficult. But yes, you have to be aware about the uh, hardware of the cath lab. And yes, most important is you should be able to manage Doppler. So that is the reason I was saying it's Doppler we can always incorporate in our nephrology fellows. Learning ultrasound and Doppler, I think, is mandatory now for nephrology programs. So yes. if you are able to do Doppler and you know how to handle the wires, I think ultrasound guided angioplasty carries very, very uh, minimal risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, apologies, my connection was off uh, the network. Are there any questions concerning the presentation? Uh, Dr. Sabhan, maybe one more one more from me. One more from me, Dr. Amar, again from Tanzania. Uh, yeah. so Dr. Sagar, with your experience, uh, what would you prefer, plasty or, uh, or stenting uh, in, in such patients? Yes. Uh, for the AV fistula, for the peripheral interventions, I avoid stenting. Uh, plasty is always advisable for the peripheral interventions, not stenting. But for central venous stenosis, uh, they have a high recurrence rate also. 
So while doing the procedure, if there is more than 50% recoil, if the patient comes back, come back to us uh, within three months, we would do a stent. Otherwise, for the first instance, uh, when the patient has come to us for the first time, generally we avoid stenting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? Lloyd, Regina? No, I've done. Uh, it's such a wonderful presentation, Dr. Gaurav. It is phenomenal. Thank you, I, I hope I could live up to your expectations. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a big exposure. <laughs> and uh, which is very, very uh, helpful for us and interesting because uh, here we have um, it's a great patient with um, vascular access. Actually, the vas vascular access is like the line of the of the life of the, of, dialysis, of the patient in dialysis and in hemodialysis, then uh, it was a, it's a good topic and the presentation was good as well. So we, we yeah. would like to place your, your presentation on YouTube, uh, if you don't mind. No, not at all, sir, not at all. Thank you so much, thank you so much. So it will be available on YouTube within the next week.